brain stem stroke. Characteristics and acute care management. Brain stem strokes can produce a wide dispersion of clinical symptoms, depending upon the type of stroke and the site of lesion. This presentation aims to discuss the clinical characteristics of brain stem strokes as well as the role of the hospital-based speech-language pathologist with the brainstem stroke patient according to the acute care consultative model. What we can see here from Kiernan and Scremin, brainstem strokes can have a wide manifestation of symptoms. The vertebral and bacillar arteries that could become blocked or hemorrhage may in fact produce an infarct or lesion in the occipital and medial temporal lobes, along with the brainstem itself and even the cerebellum. Now, according to Tiesel and Hussein, brainstem strokes do not usually affect cognition and language function. I have this point starred because as you will see, this may not always be the case. Brainstem strokes can affect both consciousness and memory, and even produce what is known as locked-in syndrome, which I will discuss more in the coming slides. There are some specific signs for brainstem strokes, such as ipsilateral cranial nerve involvement with contralateral hemiparesis, depending on the location of the, of the lesion in reference to the pyramids of the medulla. Dysphagia is a significant concern for patients with brainstem stroke, some of, who, some of whom may have a profound pharyngeal dysphagia, lacking any swallow initiation. This reality may have to be managed by a long-term alternate feeding route, such as a G-tube or a PEG tube. A little bit about etiology. Like most strokes, about 80% of brainstem strokes arise from ischemia, whether embolic or thrombotic, while 20% are hemorrhagic. Transient ischemic attacks can also manifest in the brainstem and contribute to the presence of lacunar disease or lacunar stroke. Risk factors for brainstem stroke are the same as for any location of stroke. And while there are many modifiable factors, these non-modifiable factors play a significant role as well. I just wanted to quickly note that according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, stroke does indeed vary by race and ethnicity. You can read here the statistics. It's quite staggering to see that individuals who are black have double the risk of stroke as compared to white individuals. Why is this? It's hard to say. It could be due to genetics. However, I'm of the opinion that there is a combination of systemic concerns in our nation which put minority races and ethnicities at a higher risk for stroke. Brainstem strokes can be identified according to the location of the stroke in the circulatory system, as well as the location of the lesion itself. A vertebral bacillar stroke will have a blockage in either the vertebral arteries or the bacillar artery, which you can see in the picture on the right. On the right, you also see the brainstem, which includes the midbrain, pons, and medulla. A posterior circulation stroke, which may be called a posterior circulation infarct, POCI is the acronym, or I'm sorry, the abbreviation, would occur within the posterior circulation supplying one side of the brain. This term may also include the vertebrobacillar arteries. The picture on the left is what is known as the circle of Willis from a ventral view, where you can find the posterior circulation arteries. I find the lateral view a little easier to understand, which is on the far right. Additionally, you can see from these branches listed the areas of the brain which may be affected by an infarct in one of the vertebral, bacillar, or posterior cerebral arteries. Thinking clinically, what is significant about brainstem strokes? According to the American Stroke Association, these strokes may actually be difficult to diagnose. As we know, infarcts may not show up on a CT scan right away. However, between neurology and cardiology, the team can likely determine whether the stroke was ischemic in nature 
and then TPA can be administered. As we know, TPA must be administered within the first three hours of a stroke. If it is ischemic, it cannot be used with a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, and treatment as soon as possible is going to promote the best recovery. The SLP may be consulted at this point to play a role in the differential diagnosis of the stroke. Kay and Brand Stater provide ample detail here to differentiate most vertebrobacillar strokes as compared to a hemispheric stroke. As discussed earlier, there will likely be CN involvement and cerebellar signs. There may also be sensory deficits, deficits on one side of the body. Dysarthria and dysphagia will typically be present along with vestibular symptoms. Horner syndrome may result from the interruption of the sympathetic nerve to the eye, causing meiosis, which is a constricted pupil, and mitosis, the drooping of the eyelid. If the lesion affects the occipital lobe, there will likely be visual spatial deficits. Again, in this situation, aphasia and cognitive impairments would be absent. The primary focus of the SLP here would be the dysphagia and dysarthria. Here you can see the likelihood of some of these symptoms. It's profound that greater than 70% of patients with a brainstem stroke will have an abnormal level of consciousness. This change in consciousness may provide a challenge for your assessment. May also provide a challenge for the next level of care for this patient. Additionally, close to half of the patients demonstrate bulbar manifestations, which we've talked about so far, including dysarthria dysphagia, as well as facial weakness and potential dysphonia. Again, it is important to identify some potential initial symptoms. While the symptoms may seem vast, they make sense due to the role of the brainstem, which controls all the survival activities of the CNS. For patients who survive, as some may not, especially if breathing and blood pressure are affected by the infarct, changes in level of alertness will definitely be present. Locked-in syndrome is a symptom in severe brainstem strokes. In the picture on the bottom right, you can see that the signal, which would provide in this case Eric Ramsey with motor movement for producing speech, cannot travel properly. These patients can typically only move their eyes very slightly to communicate while they are cognitively completely aware of what is going on outside of them. I won't have time to discuss it, but I've included a link here to Eric Ramsey's story and a really cool new implant that they've been using in Eric's brain, which he's been working with to create an AAC device for him. Based on the lesion location, there are a number of quote unquote classic brainstem syndromes, which are identifiable based on the symptoms. Wallenberg syndrome tends to be more well known, and it is the result of a lesion in the lateral or medial medulla. A patient with Wallenberg syndrome will most definitely be on an SLP caseload due to the presence of both dysphagia and dysarthria. I won't specifically be going through each of these syndromes, however I wanted to note the connection between the clinical picture and the lesion location. While each of these syndromes has unique characteristics, there is a general pattern of ipsilateral cranial nerve concerns and contralateral hemiparesis or sensory deficits. As the SLP in the acute care setting, you will be involved in assessment and diagnosis. Identifying the presence and or type of dysarthria and dysphagia will be key components of this differential diagnosis to ascertain whether the clinical picture matches what the neurologist is thinking and what lesions may be present in the imaging studies. While language and cognitive components are less likely, the SLP should be sure to include these areas in assessment to make certain. As seen in the previous slides, dysphagia is high in brainstem stroke patients. According to a study by Nang Wang and Lian, over 80% of the patients hospitalized with brainstem strokes initially presented with dysphagia. Almost all of those needed an alternative feeding method at initial evaluation. 
and within the study, about one-fourth of the patients were still unable to PO feed at discharge. It will be up to the clinician to determine whether or not this patient can safely PO feed, and if so, at what diet level. Counseling and education will be a large component of treatment for these patients. For the very severe patient, they may not be able to trigger a swallow reflex, and they may have significant impairments in the ability to remain conscious. Honest, empathetic, and tactful communication with the patient and family will be critical. Clear communication with the staff will provide advocacy for your patient. Within the monitoring and investigation component of the acute care model, on this patient, you need to do, you may need to do serial monitoring or serial testing to determine if there are any changes in the level of alertness or in their ability to trigger a swallow. You will need to provide your clinical opinion on the patient's ability to endure the next level of care. In summary, we see that the term brainstem stroke is actually quite wide. Brainstem strokes can be classified again by the location of the infarct within the circulatory system or by the location of the lesion corresponding to a specific brainstem syndrome. The SLP in the acute care setting will play an important role in assessing and managing the patient with a brainstem stroke through the use of the acute care consultative model.